Hello there, and are you all well today? <laughs> oh, I am so glad to hear that. And me? Never better. Thank you for asking. And where are we off to today? Well, how does a trip down memory lane with a flight into the old airport of Kai Tak in Hong Kong sound to you? Oh, good. <laughs> well, I got a message from Tom Newton who wrote, Hi, do you think you could do a landing at old Kai Tak Airport, please? Well, of course we can, yes. <laughs> Now, Tom didn't specify a starting airport, so I'm going to simply make it a go-around round-robin flight today, starting and ending at Kai Tak itself. You know, and for the occasion, I have some great scenery for Hong Kong. VHHX Kai Tak Airport is made by Fly Tampa. Beautiful scenery. You know, this airport is really quite famous. During the days when it was a British colony, it only had the one runway to accommodate all the jet traffic coming in and out. But when the jets started getting really large, like the 747s, well, then they had to build an extension that stuck out into the bay. So if you were coming in to land, say, on runway 13 and didn't manage to stop before you got to the end, <laughs> well, you might become a flotation device. <laughs> now, as a matter of interest, this same bit of engineering was also done at another British colony at Gibraltar. Only at Gibraltar, it is also part of the main road in and out of the town, and they had to put traffic lights there. <laughs> Serious! <laughs> but the real fame of Kai Tak Airport to Simmers has always been the landing on runway 13. The approach route took you over the densely populated city of Kowloon with all those tall buildings crowded with thousands of people. Just have a look at these pictures I managed to find on the internet. This one's Cathay Pacific coming in over the crowds gathered to watch. And look how close this one is flying over the street. This United Airlines 747 looks like it's going in between the buildings, doesn't it? As does this Cathay Pacific 747 on short final to land on runway 13. For pilots, the most famous marker is the checkerboard. It's at this point that the pilot makes the turn to line up on the runway. Like this Korean Air cargo flight. And yes, we shall have to do the same thing, just as this Cathay Pacific 747 did. And after the turn, and if you did it right, then you were met with this sight, the runway ahead. Now, I've been to Hong Kong many times. The first time I arrived, I was a passenger on one of these 747s coming in to land, but later I piloted planes in and out of Kai Tak. Yes, I am a commercial pilot, but I flew C-47 cargo aeroplanes, and those are propeller-driven, 
because I'm not jet rated. And the approach and landing procedures are quite a bit different between propeller aircraft and jet. For instance, at about 12 tons, I'm a lot lighter than those 747s coming into land. I'm also a lot slower and more maneuverable too. But even for me coming into land at Kai Tak, there are still the same issues. The instrument procedure is very carefully calculated and following it was very important because back in the 60s when I was in and out of Hong Kong, the Chinese communists didn't like anyone straying into their territory. And as the NOTAMs, that's the Notices to Airmen, announced on my Jefferson charts, if you strayed from the flight path, then you risked having some sudden company, just like these MiG-21s. <laughs> And as the Jefferson charts announced, you could be fired upon without warning. <laughs> but Hong Kong was a great place to be during those old days back in the 60s and early 70s. I used to stay at the Hong Kong Hilton when I was there. Well, the company I worked for had an arrangement with them. As they paid the bill, I didn't argue. <laughs> By the way, did you know that the Hilton Hotel was built on Hong Kong Island in 1963? It had 750 rooms, employed a staff of 850 people. Did you know that? They even had a tailor shop on the ground floor. And that's where I used to have my suits made when I was in town. They would measure you up on the day you arrived, that you would have a fitting that evening, and it would be ready and made and waiting for you in your room on the second day. That fast, very efficient. The Hong Kong Hilton was the only five-star hotel in the colony, and it was a really popular hotel for tourists and visiting dignitaries, uh, as well as nondescript pilots like me of dubious or questionable background. <laughs> and here's another little bit of trivia for you about the Hong Kong Hilton. In 1974, it was the first hotel in the entire world to put a minibar in every room. Really? Now every hotel, both large and small, all have minibars in the rooms. But it was introduced first, right there in Hong Kong. Now let's have a look at what we're going to do today. There aren't any Jefferson charts left anymore, so I have to make do with some old ones I managed to pull off the internet. And that also means my Navigraph won't work as before but I can show my position using it, which I will do. Now, I intend to make a round-robin flight. Depart on runway 13 and head out to the THVOR at Tathong Point. Then I'm going to turn right to head for the CHVOR at Chung Chao. From Chungchao, I will then follow the IGS-13 approach. IGS stands for Instrument Guidance System. And that will lead me around Lantau Island and over the top of where the new Hong Kong airport is built. In fact, we will see it as we cross over. Then, flying on a heading of 088 degrees, and passing through the outer marker and over Stonecutters Island before the all-important middle marker, where at 680 feet, the decision has to be made then whether to land or not. Just past the middle marker is the famous checkerboard, 
And when I get to that, I should be making my right turn to land on runway 13. So, that's the plan. How does it sound? <laughs> now, I did go into SimBrief to make a flight plan because SimBrief is very good at calculating fuel requirements. It also has the flight route that I'm going to take today and I'm going to post it in the description box below this video so you can use it yourself. It calculated I will need 4,191 kilograms of fuel on board, of which 2,351 kilograms is for reserve, and 1,193 kilograms is for the trip and taxi. Of course, I am full. When word got around that I was making a round robbing at historic Kai Tak, all the seats sold out in minutes. <laughs> or, well, perhaps it was the ton of free champagne and caviar that we have. Hmm, I'm not sure which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tom Newton, are you there? Good, because if you're ready, then get your goggles on and wrap that white silk scarf around your neck and let's get into the cockpit and get things prepared, shall we? Well, hello, Tom Newton. Welcome aboard Ryanair 186. Now, you'll have to take the jump seat today, unfortunately, right here in the center because the first officer's seat is occupied, as you can see. I've got a friend visiting with me, so he's here to make sure that I don't make any mistakes. His name is Neil. So, Neil, say hello to everybody. Hi, guys. Everybody there, enjoy the flight. And camera's over here for you on that one. Got it. Okay. See you there. <laughs> so I've got cameras everywhere to make sure that, you know, if I make a mistake, one of them's going to pick it up. <laughs> well, here we are. We are at Hong Kong. And this is, of course, the old Kai Tak Airport, uh, VHHX. Let me get my camera out here because I want to show you this magnificent scenery that's made by Fly Tampa. So, just look at this. We're looking out here over Kowloon. Now, those lights that you see flashing out here, those are, of course, the high-intensity lights for coming in to land at runway 13. But look at all of this scenery. Look how detailed this is. Isn't this magnificent? And yes, it's a fully animated scenery that, Kai, uh, that Fly Tampa did. They have kamikazes here, so we have to watch out for the kamikazes. And look at all of these 747s. I feel dwarfed in this 737. And now here, yes, these blokes standing here, they're animated. So plenty of stuff there. And looking out over there, my goodness, look at the detail of all of this. And we've got a perfect day for flying. Look at the, look at the weather. Just a few clouds flitting overhead, so there shouldn't be any problem with being able to take some good video while we're en route. And remember the photographs I showed you just a few minutes ago? This is one of the bridges that they would stand on as the jets came in to land over the top of them. Beautiful scenery. So that, Neil, is where we're at. So we've gone back in time. So Ryanair 186 is a time machine today. We're a bit of a TARDIS. We've gone back in time. We're in the 1960s because that's when I was flying in and out of here. It was in the 60s. And uh, if you straight, oh, there's a kamikaze getting ready to come around. But if you strayed off your flight path, 
I mean, you get those MiG-21s appearing really fast. And uh, to let you know that uh, you had uh, trespassed. Whoa! And it's uh, certainly, uh, it certainly wakes you up. <laughs> I can imagine. You think you've got all of the countryside to yourself and you've got the freedom of the skies. Not if you stray outside of the old colonial borders of Hong Kong. Right. Now, I've got the fuel on board. I have, let's see, we have four tons of fuel for this particular trip. So 4,191 kilograms of fuel have been loaded. And we also have, of course, one ton of champagne and caviar, because we do things right here, you know, and it's complimentary too, you know. Those were the days. <laughs> oh, yeah. Especially with my landings, I want everybody as drunk as possible. <laughs> All right, okay. <clears throat> and over here, as I showed you before, this is the route that we're going to take. It's just a round robin. So it's going to be a pretty straightforward flight today. Right, the first thing that we do then is I turn on the battery and I make sure here I've got 26 volts. Then I turn on the fuel pumps to get the fuel moving. And then down here, I turn on the APU, that's the auxiliary power unit. I was explaining to Neil, the APU is located in the tail of the aircraft. And it, of course, has a generator on it that we need in order to get the voltage to power everything here for programming. The low oil pressure light has come on, which is good. It means that the oil is moving around, is what that does, it's kicked it up. And there's the engine gas temperature. Are you impressed, by the way? Oh, yeah. This is assimilated with the way that everything is working. Fantastic. Better than the real thing. Well, the thing of it is, it is supposed to be the real thing. Because yeah. <laughs> what I do on here is what you actually have to do in a real cockpit. And if you don't do it, then it does the same thing as in a real aircraft. It doesn't work. Now the engine gas temperature has come down. It stabilized. There it is. Now we have... 115 volts and I switch from the battery which is just 20 you know 8 volts to now the APU which is giving us all of this now I'm going to turn on the what we call the IRS the IRS is a nothing to do with the tax man but it's to do with satellite navigation I never had any of this when I was flying let me tell you, it was compass and a map is how I did my flying. Occasionally I had VORs that I could, you know, point to and make my way, but ah, the things that they've got today is amazing. But there are two on here, and what they will do is I'll get two different uh, sets of navigation aids, and then I need to locate myself on the Earth's surface for a starting point. Just like you do in a sat nav in your car. It wants to know where are you, yeah. put your start point in, and then it will calculate where you're going to go to. Your location. Yeah, you've got to put your location in. So that's what I'm doing right now. Now that switch, that turns on the galley so that the, uh, tea, the tea can be made, the coffee can be made, the microwave can be made, uh, activated cooking, the cuisine, all of the rest of it, the galley is now occupied. Emergency exit lights. These are those lights that go down the center of the airplane, you know, in case it's dark and you need to find your way out. This is the power. Fasten seat belts and no smoking. The, so the command is right here. And then, attendance, show our guests to their seats very posh seat. Then over here, the left and the right window heat. So I've got a, my windows each have heaters in them. And by the way, I did go around and I did check the tires. I kicked them, made sure that everything was all right. And I even cleaned the windows. Are you, are you impressed at how clean oh, the windows are? I mean, look at how clean yeah, they are. It's almost like they're not there. <laughs> 
Okay. And then the probes. Now, proper 737s probably would not turn the probes on. They're located on each side of the aircraft and they stick out and they keep everything warm. And without those, you don't know your altitude, your speed or anything. It's very important. But outside crews, if they put their hand on them, they could get a nasty burn. Oh, wow. So that's the reason why they don't usually turn those on. But I'm an old pilot from flying the days when C-47s, I mean, I always turned on the probe because I never had a crew out there. I was lucky if I had my loadmaster was sober to load up the aircraft. <laughs> and uh, so that's what the probes are. I don't think we're going to need any anti-ice today, but we will need the hydraulic pumps. This one says the forward service hatch is open. That's the door that we came in to get in. The equipment, those are the air stairs. Those are the stairs that go out and go down. Now you can see all these big 747s, they've got all these posh motorized things that yeah. come up and allow passengers to get on and off. But you know, each of those are charged to the companies. Ah. So Ryanair, they yeah. have their own stairs right. so they don't have to pay for the stairs. Yeah. Same way with the baggage, yeah. they would have to pay for the baggage. So they say, carry on only. Saves money, saves you money, saves them money. And more importantly, since there are airport fees for you sitting on the tarmac the length of time, the more minutes you're on the ground, the more money you have to pay to the airport. So it's all a matter of dollars and cents. Yeah. Now, over here, I'm going to turn on the APU bleed. This is for the heat and turning on the hydraulic and the packs and listen there's that rush of air going through all the nozzles and then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the steady light and it lets the people on the ground know that there's a couple of idiots in here that are playing around basically it says we're in control hello folks right now, first thing I'm going to do this time is a little different. I want to listen into the uh, air, eight, uh, the ATIS. That's the Automated Terminal Information Service to find out what the active runway is. I'm pretty much sure I know what it is, but let's let's listen in. And the frequency is one two eight decimal two. So one two eight. Decimal two. Victor, hotel, hotel, X ray, airport information, Kilo, zero, four, five, seven, Zulu, wind, one, three, three, at one, three, visibility, greater than 20 miles, sky condition, 8,100, scattered, temperature, two, zero, dew point, altimeter, one, 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 zero, one, three, landing and departing, runway, one, three, VFR aircraft, say direction of flight, all aircraft read back, hold short instructions, advise controller on initial contact you have, Kilo. Well, we have Kilo. Kilo, they update this about every hour to let you know what the wind direction is, what weather conditions are like, any problems and what the active runway is. So we know the active runway is 13 and that's over there. So now we have that information. And by the way, this is called this is called the radio pedestal right here. This is where all the controls are. And uh, each of these are radios, there's two radios. And I have two navigation units, and I've got over here an ADF unit. Now, I'm going to put in some information that we need. So for the NDB is 337. So I have to tune in to 337. And this is important because the approach that we're going to do is um, requires what they call DME measurement, distance measuring equipment. So if the signal is coming from a certain point, we can measure the distance to that signal. 
and at certain points I have to make turns, right. decisions. So that's why that's important. And then the uh, that is then one 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 point nine. So one 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 point nine. And that is the frequency of the uh, DME measuring equipment right here at this point, right here. See, this is the chart I'm going to be using yeah. right there. That's a chart. Yeah. yeah. So 111.9 one, one, one or decimal nine. And right here, this is the outer market and the middle market. So there's going to be some things that we now have to program in. All right. So, let's go ahead and program the FMC. Now this is the FMC, the Flight, Manage uh, Flight Management Computer. And uh, want to go here, clear off the extra stuff. We check that the air act data is current and that the program is there, that there are no errors. We put in now our start position. But for the moment, I'm going to put in VHHX, which is the designator for Hong Kong Kai Tak. Yeah, we are at gate 27. Stand 27 is where we're at. So I'm going to do 27 and put that in. And it comes up with the information. 22.19.4, this is in the database. We're going to take that, and to do it, I'm going to put that into the temporary memory, push that, and now, suddenly, we have live screens. Now I go into root, and I'm going to put in the VHHX for the origin, and VHHX for a destination, because we're going to do the round robin. We are flight number, we're Ryanair, so RYR, and we're number 186. So I put that in as well. Now I'm going to go to next page, and the first point that we're going to go to, in actual fact, is TH. TH. So I'm going to put TH in here, right there. And there it is. There's Tatong Point right there that's the one I'm going to choose so now I've got that in activate now I'm going to go to departures I'm going to put in runway 13 for our departure execute go to departures and arrivals go here we're using the IGS 13 route coming in and that is all I'm going to put in and I'm going to execute that. Is that a standard routine? Is that commonly used? Yeah, well, this is the IGS route that I'm looking at here, so it shows this. So right. anybody programming the FMC with the IGS 13 is going to bring all of this information in. Right. Now, going into legs, as you can see, it's brought up all of the routes, but there's a discontinuity here. Now, when we get to Tathong Point, because it's a very sharp turn at that point, let me um, see this, how, how wow. sharp a point that is. Well, what I want to do is make a smoother turn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in what we call a phantom waypoint. And I want that waypoint to be 225 degrees from Tathong Point in that direction and five miles away. So therefore, when I make it, it'll be a nice smooth turn. So I'm going to push this and it puts it in at the bottom. I go 225 and five miles. So 225 degrees and five miles. And I put that up there. Then I bring that up there. And now we have a route and I'm going to show you how that route works I'm going to video this so that you can see I'm going to 
First of all, I'm going to switch this to plan. And so it changes everything on here. So I'm going to, uh, there we are. So there's where we're at. I'm going to go out here. There's tack on point. And see, now it's a nice curved route around. And I'm going to go step through each one of the legs. I'm going to step through each one as it set, and it centers when I get to it. So there's Chung uh, Chao. And then the next one, of course, is golf. All of this, of course, came in with the pre-program of you know, choosing the IGS-13. And then there's the SL... NB is a, a non-directional beacon. The D15, that's over the top of the new uh, airport. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then there's the outer marker. The next one, all important, middle marker, that's the one that's also the decision height. And as you can see, it's got it here at 610 feet. And then after that, runway 13. So, we have a good plan. So all I've got to do now is switch back, and we're good to go. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the weather on my side, put the data on. I'm going to use terrain radar on yours. Now that's going to tell you any high spots. Please don't let me fly into any mountains. It would be very, very embarrassing. Only do it once. No, yeah, only do it once. And now I'm going to turn on the TCAS. TCAS is something else which I never had in my aeroplane. I mean, TCAS is, an, is a warning system, so that if you find that you're on a collision course, the TCAS in that aeroplane will make a decision whether to go up or down, or this one will do the same thing. So if this one says, climb, climb, then I pull back to climb, and that one will say, descend, descend, and that way it avoids a collision. TCAS also gives me the position of all the other aircraft that are around me that are using the system. So I can avoid them on my radar screen. These are amazing things. I never had a glass cockpit. I had the old analog, what we call steam-driven dials and gauges, you know. And sometimes you had to tap them or kick them to get them to work. <laughs> so that's basically what we do to set up. Right, now the next thing I've got to do is I'm going to go in here now into the route and perform the initialization. So we've got our fuel and it's all loaded in. We've got 4,191 kilos. The reserves are 2,351. Trip and taxi is calculated to be 1,193. That's 3,544. Now 3544, four, when you round it out, that's 3.5. That's to the nearest whole number. Yeah. So I'm going to put 3.5 for the plan. 2351, I'm rounding that out to 2.4. That's for my reserves, 2.4. My cost index is 6. Now, I used to have to work all this out by hand. You know, getting a piece of paper out and calculator and running all the rest of it. Now, the onboard computers do it all, but it needed that 115 volts. So, I double click this, and look, it calculates everything. It says what the zero fuel weight is and all the rest. My goodness, it's got it all sorted. Now, the next thing I'm going to put in is 080, which is my cruising altitude. I'm going to go up to 8,000 feet, then we'll be making our descent. Normally, I would put in cruise wind, but I'm going to ignore that. Uh, transition altitude, I'm going to... Let's see, transition altitude here, I think, is 9,000 feet. So 9, 
9,000 feet and put that in. See, this is an onboard computer. By the way, both sides do the same thing. And so now I've got yours on the progress side. So that is now got everything in it that we need. Execute that. It's like pressing enter on a keyboard. Go to N1 limit. Now the M1 limit, sometimes there are noise abatement procedures, so you make all those adjustments here, but we're Ryanair. Resistance is futile. They will be assimilated, so we just ignore all the noise abatements. We just go full power. So I'm gonna go the full 20 degrees, which is what the outside air temperature is. Go to takeoff, go to flaps 10 for our takeoff. Now I double click this, and it calculates everything for me. So the center of gravity, that's where the weight is distributed, is within the standard norms. The trim wheel, that's this one, is set for 4.79, which it is. I do one click on each of these, like that, and it gives me B1, BR, which is rotation speed, which is when I pull back, and B2 is when I lift off. Calculates everything. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. Now we have to do the other part. This is called the MCP, uh, the main control panel. First of all, I'm going to set this for 8,000 feet, which is going to be our cruising altitude. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to set this. Now this is the pressurization. If I don't do this, I get all kinds of warning signs. The landing altitude is zero because the airport elevation is 15 feet. So I'll leave that at zero because if you look, it goes in and goes in 50. Exactly. And our departure runway direction is on 13. It's actually magnetic 136. So. I do 136, if you'll do 136 over there, turn it to the right to make that go to 136. Go to the right. Yeah, do it slower. Uh, coming up. 136 and then I'll put the main heading in as 136 notice how it changes the course heading on the screen oh, yeah, yeah. so 136 and then the map is 143 so this is the takeoff speed this is what we call the bugs the takeoff bugs why is it called bugs well it's a little bug that appears on the screen <laughs> yeah It'll, it'll come up on the side. Now, I put the flight director on my side, on your side, and then I push the VNAV button and the LNAV button, and I have green lights on both, which means I have a good flight plan. Push that up. I've now armed all of the information for the auto throttle. VOR1 is armed. VOR1 is armed over there. This is VOR1, this is VOR2. Now I'm going to put the yaw damper on, and the yaw damper is to stop all of the, the excessive movements. People get a little air sick when that's not on. And now you can see at the bottom of your screen we have the extra information that's popped up. It's got DME, that's Distance Measuring Equipment. The next thing I'm going to put in is 620. I'm going to do the 620 for decision height. Since the chart I was just using had 620 on it, I'm going to use that one. So this is a barometer setting. And what it does is it takes the barometer setting and then it gives you the altitude. There we go, 620. Now, it happens to be that we are 1013, 1013, and that is the barometric pressure at the minute, and that says exactly what our 
elevation is, is 15 feet. This means that when we get down to 620 feet, it'll say, minimums, minimums. And then you say, should I, shouldn't I? Could I, could I not? Uh, you know, that's the panic point. You know, up until that point, it's plain sailing, anybody can do it, but when it's decision height, then you've got to make a choice. I'm going to set the auto brake to RTO for ready for takeoff. Good. And all of that is set. All of that is set. The 2200 on my transponder. The transponder code. If I was to switch this to 7500, I don't think it would happen on this simulator, but in real life, I would be surrounded by SWAT, police, hijacked. Hijacks, the hijack code. Yeah, 7500. Yeah. So please don't put 7500 in there. We're going to have enough problems dealing with MiG 21s in case we stray over the border. Well, not while you're looking at ones anyway. All right. Okay. <laughs> right, I think that we are about ready. Now, as I said, I'm going to put the programming in that I did, I'm going to put that in the description box below this video so that you can all see. And the Navigraph chart I'm going to put right here so that you can see where I'm actually flying today. Now I'm going to bring up the stairs, close the doors. Our self-loading cargo has aborted. <laughs> You hear the electric stairs? Yeah. Now, I'm actually in a stand which does not require a pushback. Although that damn thing has parked itself there, it shouldn't have, but anyway. But we're just going to ignore it and we're going to do it as we would uh, ordinarily. Which means start the engines in place and then move around and taxi to the active. But in order to do that, first thing we need to do is we need to start the engines, then we'll get clearance to taxi to the active, and then we'll go from there, all right? So, attendance, warn the people, we are about to start the engines. Now, um, we've got two engines. I'll start number one today first. Is that okay? So I'm going to switch to generator one, which is zero at the moment, because it's obviously it's not uh, running. Well, wait a minute, before we do that, we do the checklist. I forgot. I'm getting excited you know, about this. So fuel is on. Windows are all locked. <laughs> Seatbelt signs are on. Door lights are out. MCP is programmed. Takeoff thrust bugs, speed bugs all done, CDU pre-flight is done, rudder aerolon trim is pretty and clear, taxi takeoff briefing, I've already said we're going to pull out there and go to that. Anti-collision light is now going on. And we're ready to start the engines. Okay, first thing we want to do is to turn off the left and the right pack. So if you'll do that please, left. No, 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 not the middle one, and the right pad. Good. Now I'm going to start engine number one. And then over here, start valve has opened. The air pressure is building up. N2 is building up. When this gets to 24, I'm going to introduce the fuel. And coming up, 24. Now the fuel has been introduced, I'm going to look for the engine gas temperature to start winding up. By the way, these are degrees Celsius, look at that temperature. Ooh. I'm looking for the low oil pressure light to go out, which it did. Now I'm right about now, I should be here, the, should hear the engines. Yep. There, you hear, that's engine number one. Up here I have to verify that we have 115 volts. We do. Switching to engine number two and starting engine number two. So start valve has opened. 
it's starting to spin up there's the N2 spinning up when it gets to 24 I'll bring in the fuel and here's the fuel lever right here in fact when it gets to it you do that pull it out and bring it all the way up do it now good now we're looking for the engine gas temperature to ignite and it has since there's fuel in there it's combusting so it's building up heat you see and I'm looking for the low oil pressure light to go out it has and we should hear the second engine kick in in just a moment I'm looking up here also for 115 volts there there's the second engine I heard it there it is and clicking that off good now that tick light just went off and it says that both engines are now balanced and are producing electricity so now I'm going to go up here and I'm going to push both of those down which now I'm taking electricity from the main engines I'm going to go over here and you can turn on the pack into auto which is the middle position and the other one and then I want you to turn the APU bleed off pushing it up and I'll turn it off here so now the APU has been shut off and we are ready now to make our move now if you lift this up and bring it to 10 please that's the flaps and there the flap indicator will move up and we'll get a green light in just a moment I've got to verify the takeoff speeds and one adjustment there right now I need to contact the tower and we're going to depart straight out and then when we're on our way and we intercept uh, Chung Chao we'll get our clearance to land at that point but we, right now we want to have a departure straight out so that's number three ground Ryanair 186 with Oscar request taxi to the active straight out departure Ryanair 186 taxi to and hold short of runway 13 using taxiway Bravo 1 Alpha 1 contact tower on 118.7 when ready Taxi in full short runway 13 via taxiway Bravo 1 Alpha 1 Ryanair 186 I've got my toggle switch here which uh, uh, is pressed to talk but I have the artificial intelligence on here doing all of the talking for me. Right, generators are on, probe heat is on, anti-ice not required, isolation valve is auto, engine start levers are good, flight deck door is closed, recall is check flight controls check flaps green light remember we watched that film last night yeah tom cruise in the in the captain's seat of that boeing 737 for who was it that was um trans world airlines wasn't it That's twa, TWA. Right. Yes, yes. she's not that yeah and he was bored and bored and bored anyway th this is what he was doing yeah yeah right here and auto brake, RTO check, speed brake lever, down and detent, ground equipment is clear, get out of the way. Right, we are now ready to taxi. So, crew, we're going to move. I'm turning on the taxi lights. And, right. Now I have a steering tiller over here on this side and the other way of controlling it is with my feet. This doesn't do anything. So brake off, give a little boost to get unstuck and then we make our turn waving goodbye to the ground equipment that we no longer need. Now you can see Hong Kong Island out over there. That's where the Hilton Hotel is, where I stayed. 
but they allowed anybody in there, even people like me. <laughs> look, they even got a skyscraper. Oh yeah. Indeed. So what tell me, what do you think? Simulator is pretty impressive, isn't it? It's really impressive, yeah. Yeah. I did fly out of here in the eighties. In the eighties? Yeah. Well, I was doing mine in the late 60s. Yeah, amazing. It really is. This is really, really amazing piece of scenery. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So I'm going to move into position and then I'm going to contact the tower and ask for clearance to take off. You know, they do like to be asked. I don't know why, you know. They never send me Christmas cards, you know, out for traffic control. All right, so I need to go to the tower, which is 118 decimal 7. So 118 and decimal 7. And, oh, we're not far enough in yet. We need to be a bit more. Request takeoff clearance. Ryanair 186 ready for takeoff, departing straight out. Ryanair 186 cleared for takeoff, runway 13, departing straight out, approved. Cleared for takeoff, runway 13. We're approved. Alright, now I'm going to turn on all the lights, switching the engines. Here's, see, before takeoff. Takeoff briefing is reviewed. We're going to go straight out. We're not going to hit anything on the way. Remember that. Engine bleeds are on. At start switches continuous. Cabin is secure. And I am starting the clock. All right. Everything is looking good. So now I'm going to move out into position. By the way, um, 60 some odd tons. So it takes a little bit of juice to get myself unstuck and moving. So make sure nothing is coming, please. Okay. There's a Huey parked over there. Oh, yeah, I see it. And line up on the runway. Okay, everything is looking good. Now, advancing the power to N1. We have balanced power, choker button push, full power, we are rolling. I'm now steering with my feet. This is the uh, landing place for all of the uh, um, amphibious. See oh, that yeah. piece of water Thank right there? V2. V2 rotates and and we have positive rate. Gear up please. Pull all, all the way up to the top. Thank you. And going on to autopilot. Thank you very much. And then pull out and go to the off position. 
little respect here too. Okay, there's that. That's the new one. We'll be flying right over the top of that as we make our turn.
see in a moment the famous checkerboard that all the pilots have to look at. Oh, and you can see the flashing lights. See the flashing lights? Those are the, that's the approach lights coming into runway 13. 2500. 2500, check. You see the, the little lights flash? It'll get clearer as we come to it. I can almost see the checkerboard from here, almost. All right, flaps 10, please. Okay, gear down and four flaps. Gear down, please. And technically we're supposed to, when it comes up, we have three green lights, flaps are down. Outer marker, and we are one thousand seven. One three. I have control. <laughs> you want to jump out? Jump out! This is your chance. <laughs> straight for the checkerboard. And the checkerboard is that square. Just to the left and slightly above the beginning of the Vase lights. Speed is good, descending looking good. Flaps are up. 
no lights, everything stowed, good. Right, we're now ready to taxi to stand 27. I'm a bit wider than your car. My car sticks out quite a bit on both sides. So I actually have to ride the middle line. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are now taxiing into Kai Tak Airport. Welcome to Hong Kong. The temperature outside is 20 degrees Celsius. The wind is calm, nice overhead, and your taxi service is waiting to pick you up to take you to your favorite hotel. We thank you for flying with Ryanair 186. How's that? Just like the big boys, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you got the job. Right, APU is now active and we'll pull into stand 27 just like we started with. This is a replica of the Kai Tak Airport. The rest of it, of course, you didn't get these skyscrapers back in the 60s. Oh, that is all new. Some pretty impressive buildings there. Just so many as well. Yeah. Well, I hope that we gave all those people who were standing on the bridge with all their cameras a good show today. What do you think? Yeah. We came in low enough, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, I think I was looking at those buildings. Ah. Reach out and uh, take the laundry. Just about. Well, that's what it's like. That's actually what it's like. Now, at C-47, we didn't do the full route. We actually got to Chung Chow and then we made our turn in because a C-47 is much slower and it's also uh, much more maneuverable than one of these and uh, and i would fly it in visually anyway those high intensity lights even in murky weather even in the rainy season you can see those things in the rainy season the lights are very bright you'd be surprised just how bright they are catch your eye yes and of course, when you're looking for them and you know what the angle that you should be, then you know if you're too low or too high. Well, well through. And to think this, of course, was extended. The engineers came in here when jets started to come in and out and extended this out into the bay, just like they did at Gibraltar. But Gibraltar has one extra feature that this one doesn't have. Gibraltar, of course, the runway stick out into the bay both sides, but they have the main road going into Gibraltar cutting right through the middle, so they have traffic lights. <laughs> so if you can imagine traffic lights on a main runway. I've been across it. I've been there. Well, I've landed on that. See if I can do a bit more tourism here. Show this. It's tricky to steer and hold the camera at the same time. But there's the detail of Kai Tak Airport, made by Fly Temper. Lovely, lovely design. And our frame rate is 18, 18, 19. And we're using full 
4K monitors on top of all of that. Just look at all the detail. They really have recreated this beautifully. <coughs> well, there's our stand just up ahead and we'll be moving into that. <coughs> See, this is stand 27 coming up. Remember, the wheel is behind us, so you have to go over it before you can make the turn. So you line up just like that. And now we're going to scare that fellow in that vehicle, in the pushback vehicle. He's going to say, you're getting close. He's getting really close. When is it going to stop? That's what he's thinking. Is he going to stop? <laughs> And brakes, there we go, brake on, and APU on, engines off, lights off, GCAS is off, your damper, galley, seat belts, stairs, and doors are open. Right, they're getting off. Good. Now, the last thing is turn off the fuel pumps, turn off the APU, turn off the battery, and Shutdown is complete. Right. Tom Newton, you rode in the back. You saw it right from the back end all the way through. We didn't do too bad, did we? The trick, of course, is always to fly it in manually. Don't rely on the instruments to do it all because the instruments want to take you a slightly different route. It's a little different uh, on this. So take over soon. Make the turn when you want to make the turn at the last minute. When you think it's you're right on top of that checkerboard, that is when you want to make the turn. And we did that and came in for a picture perfect landing, don't you think? Yep. Right. Right, Tom. Thank you for making the suggestion. I hope that we lived up to your expectations and we will see you again and everyone else will see you on another flight of Ryanair 186. Bye everybody.